Hi, my name is Steve Von Till. I've known for playing in the group Neurosis, as well as under the moniker Harvest Men and under my own name with my solo work. I've been asked by Revolver to talk about 11 non-metal albums, which uh, the Revolver audience might be interested just didn't check it out. You know, being a music nerd like I am and having a huge record collection and, and loving music of all different genres, it's the hardest part is deciding which 11 to go with. The first album, which is also a film, is called Last and First Men by Johan Johansson. It was his first film that he had made himself shot on 16 millimeter. The footage is all of these monuments called Spominics. I'm not sure if I am pronouncing that correctly, but they are in the former Yugoslavia and they are these space age abstract memorials that look like nothing you've ever seen. But it's really minimal at times, really emotionally heavy. A lot of electronic elements brought in with the strings and, and uh, symphonic elements. But the best way to listen to this one is to actually get the DVD and watch the movie because in the movie version, you don't only have the music, but you also have Tilda Swinton narrating and reading from a 1930 English sci-fi novel, which is where the, the name Last and First Men comes from. It comes across as a channeled text from a future version of humanity billions of years from now coming back to tell us about ourselves and uh, the warnings of our ultimate demise. The second album uh, in my list is by another uh, modern um, avant-garde composer, um, this one American, William Bazinski. I chose his album, Melancholia. which came out around the same time as some of the ones he's more known for, the disintegration loops. And I think this album followed a similar technique of taking small melodic phrases from decaying and degrading tape loops that he recorded, rearranging them and allowing them to turn into and blossom into these hauntingly beautiful larger pieces. I like Melancholia uh, the most just because it has exactly what it sounds like. These are very hauntingly sad, but beautiful, beautiful songs. Third on the list is uh, from a band who came out of the ashes of Throbbing Gristle, which I'll get to later, Coil, an album called Astral Disaster. Myself. Where I had gotten into ambient music earlier, most of it wasn't quite dark enough or compelling enough for my tastes, for the most part. When I was younger and didn't appreciate it much, it, it came across as new agey. What separated them from a lot of other, what later became known as like dark ambient or became a whole genre, is they were always really well recorded, very three-dimensional. They didn't seem locked into some groove or set of rules. Uh, but they seemed very steeped in the tradition of using electronics in kind of a ritual and psychedelic context, which is, is things I've always loved about music from the first time I heard, you know, early Tangerine Dream or some of the Krautrock stuff that used electronics or even Hawkwind, you know, using these kind of elements in uh, something more shamanic, but Coil takes it to another level where they forego the band structures and rock structures and song structures and take it straight into these dark sonic landscapes. Number four on the list, we're going into uh, heavy rock, but not uh, not anything metal or even metal adjacent. Laughing Hyenas, Life of Crime. I remember I, I was relatively new in Neurosis and was just getting into, into this band. They were on uh, Touch and Go. And the singer, John Brannon, was well known from uh, Hardcore Legends' Negative Approach. And if you've ever heard his voice, it's one of the most distinct, powerful, intense voices ever. He, I mean, he's one of one of the most incredible vocalists. It makes most of other like shouting and screaming singers seem like pale Muppet imitations of what he does, where it, where it truly sounds like gut wrenching human anguish, bluesy, hypnotic, kind of proto punk with an extremely original approach gu guitar. The guitarist Larissa Strickland, I guess she had not ever played guitar before they formed this band, so it's a really unique approach. Really, no. Um, preconceived notions of what should be there. 
all on top of a super tight rhythm section. Bass player and drummer just locked in and killing it. Number five comes from probably the genre of music I listen to the most when I'm just uh, chilling out or working out in the Neurot Recordings office or at work before the students come in. I listen to a lot, a lot of dub music. Adrian Sherwood. My favorite record that I go back to the most is from a project called Creation Rebel, and it's the Starship Africa album. What I love about dub in general, and this album in particular, is, is using the studio as the instrument. It, it kind of what was tracked doesn't really matter. It's the performance of the mix, where you've turned it into something else, and anything is fair game. You can destroy, filter, delay, EQ, chop, mute, sample, and bring back any sound in any sort of new form. And so each each mix becomes a new idea. Each treatment becomes a, a new and, and unique approach to whatever the basic rock tracks are. And I've, I've used that approach a lot and borrowed a lot of the tricks with my Harvest Man material where I'm sitting here in this room trying to turn this kind of like raw primal matter of, of tracks that I put down over long periods of time and uh, crafting it into something, turning it into something uh, more compelling than just the, the layered tracks on top of each other. Really grateful for him and and him getting me into, you know, really playing delays, playing filters, playing the Mutron phaser, um, playing the EQ sweeps and, uh, you know, not being afraid to uh, mute and destroy the tracks. You know, nothing is sacred, all is fair game. Just make it, uh, make it a compelling performance. And number six brings us to the godfather of ambient music, Brian Eno. Now, I think his first uh, ambient record was uh, Music for Airports. And in his series of, of music like this, I think this was his fourth, and it's called On Land. A little bit darker and uh, deeper, and I think earthier than a lot of the other ones. Some of the other ones are a little more radiant and uplifting and maybe joyous. And this is a little more in my wheelhouse. And oddly enough, this record and uh, Tired Sounds of Stars of the Lid probably have more hours of playtime in my ears than any other record, specifically because I would often just put it on headphones while traveling, leave it on repeat. And so, you know, if I had the good fortune of falling asleep on a Euro European flight. I could get through this album, you know, eight times in a row. So it's just kind of programmed in there. Some of the, the strange little gurgling and bubbling sounds and and uh, stuff going on inside the textures. You know, what can I say? He's one of my heroes. Just his whole philosophy towards uh, creating that type of music. I mean, it's clear I've integrated those ideas into most of what I've been a part of since getting into it. For number seven, there was a time when I was getting really into the British folk revival that was happening in the 60s and early 70s. One of my favorite bands of that was Fairport Convention. Their kind of quintessential album, in my opinion, is called Liege and Leaf. And I fell in love with Sandy Denny's voice. She was the singer. But her first solo record from 1971 the North Star, Grassman, and the Ravens. When it was drunk, the ship it was sunk. Such a beautiful, nuanced, emotionally heavy record. I, I can't say enough good things about it. It really, it gets me every time. I am so in love with that record, so in love with her voice. So for Metalheads, she's the voice with Robert Plant on the Battle of Evermore. Uh, the only other voice to ever be on a Led Zeppelin record. So there's a starting point for how incredible her voice is. North Star Grassman and the Ravens is, is untouchable. It's it's incredible. Album number eight. Uh, I'm going back to back to heavy music. 1984, the Midwestern band De Kreutzen put out their self-titled LP. For myself and a lot of other guitar players at the time, this was a game changer. They definitely were playing at hardcore tempos, but the guitar player was playing really unique, dissonant guitar shapes, unlike traditional bar chords, more, more akin to 
kind of what Voivod did in the metal realm. Like, like for those of us that were in the know, we put De Kreutzen and Voivod in their own musical category because the guitar players were playing these crazy augmented dissonant guitar chords that nobody else was really using. And it was really, really fascinating to have more of a sonic palette that you weren't limited to the bar chords and single notes. The band as a whole was tight. Uh, the drummer had a way of playing these really fast uh, beats with a double snare hit rather than a single one that most people would play, which made it sound even more uh, frenetic. Kind of echoing what I said earlier about, about John Brand, the, the singer De Kreutzen had an equally incredible voice in, in a different way. It didn't quite have that power of all of humanity with it uh, like Brandon does, but a really uh, ultra harmonic, um, screechy scream that, I don't know, it, it really draws you in. It's really, it, it does sound pain and, and anguished and, and intense and, and otherworldly at times. Yeah, number nine, Towns Van Zant. I don't know if this is breaking the rules, but who gives a shit? I'm gonna say that I'm just gonna pick songs throughout his catalog and go make a mixtape. Times I don't know where this dirty road is taking me. He's got, I mean, he's got the stuff that he's known for, like Poncho and Lefty, which the Highwaymen did, and, and Willie Nelson and lots of other folks did, and some other really beautiful songs, kind of in the, uh, not quite outlaw country, but definitely in those outsider guys that were writing at the time down in Texas. And he was a little bit more psychedelic, a little more of a poet, but a true outsider to the end. He had some really dark and compelling songs that, that there's only one or two per album, usually, and some are on obscure compilations. But I would say the Spider Song, the whole Snake Song, Waiting Around to Die, Nothing, Lungs, and perhaps the strangest of all of them, the Silver Ships of Andalar. He obviously went to some pretty dark places in his mind, and uh, they came out as beautiful songs. Number 10, I mentioned this group earlier. Throbbing Gristle, second annual report. Uh, they integrated noise before noise was a scene. They still used psychedelic and hypnotic elements that, that may have come from them you know, witnessing bands like Hawkwind at their, at their trippiest and uh, most out there, but really turning it into something grimy dirty and of course they to they coined the term industrial music i think they named their record label industrial records and that's where the term came from they were just using whatever instruments and electronics and signal generators <clears throat> pulses vocal effects anything to create this really terrifying soundscape when i first heard that on headphones it scared the shit out of me final album on this list of 11 and only because uh I limited it to 11. We could have been here all day digging out of the record bins. I decided to go with Bauhaus uh, in the flat field. You know, Bauhaus, of course, everybody knows Bella Lugosi's Dead, um, which has a certain certain vibe. But this, this first record, it, such crazy angular avant-garde noise guitar that, uh, you know, can, as a guitarist who doesn't, like to fall into like regular rock or heavy music tropes. I, I love the way uh, the guitarist approached things from a dissonant, noisy, textural point of view. Another really driving rhythm section, bass and drum locked into really powerful stuff. It's way more aggro than most um, goth stuff at the time. The vocals were really passionate. They had a really uh, kind of intense range. And I just really like uh, I like all their early albums, but uh, I think this one has a special spot. Well, there you go. That's my list. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Come check me out on tour with my band, my solo band, this summer. I'll be on tour from July 1st till the middle of August um, in 27 different parts of the U.S. So go to vontill.org slash tour. Check out the dates. You can also find the dates on my Bandcamp page or neurorecordings.com. Would love you to join me for an evening of sonic purge and catharsis.